Well, thank you. It is a huge honor to be here talking to you about Young Life tonight. I've been a volunteer with them for 30 years. I was a leader for 12 years, and you've probably put it together tonight that Young Life works with teenagers. So when I was putting together my talk, I had tons and tons of teenage stories going through my head, and I settled on one to tell you about myself when I was a teenager. But before I get into it, you've got to know one thing about me. I'm a moron. Okay, I was on work crew at a summer camp, and we worked a lot in the kitchen. And I was walking through the kitchen one day, and I slipped on some grease. And instead of telling people, hey, watch it, be careful, it's slippery there, or God forbid, cleaning it up, I was like, hey, that was kind of fun. And I slid one way and I slid the other way and people saw what I was doing and they joined in and we're sliding around and we're having fun. And that's when the moron kicked in. And I was like, you know, it'd be even funner is if I poured a half gallon of cooking oil all over the floor. And I did, I poured it all over the floor and then we were really sliding around and we were having a ball until one of the work crew guys goes outside to get a running start. He comes literally flying through the door at Mach 6, hits the ground in the surfer position, slides across the floor and straight into one of those giant commercial uh, refrigerators, bounces off, lands on his face, no movement whatsoever. And we're all laughing because we think he's doing the dramatic pause and he's going to pop up, but he didn't pop up. He started to curl up. He was having a seizure and we didn't know what to do. And so I ran over there and I grabbed him and he was like hard as a rock. I remember that. And I rolled him over and I thought maybe he hurt his neck. I've got to immobilize his neck. So I jumped down there and I put him in a headlock and uh, I'm holding him there. His face is right here. And I looked at his, his eyes were rolled back in his head. His face was like deep, dark red. His jaws were locked open about an inch and he wasn't breathing and he wasn't breathing and he wasn't breathing and I was like oh my gosh I think he swallowed his tongue and so I got two fingers and I know you're not supposed to do this but I jammed them in the back of his throat and pulled his tongue out and held it down so that he could breathe and I looked at him and his eyes were still rolled back his face was dark blue and he still wasn't breathing and he wasn't breathing and I thought, oh my gosh, this guy is going to die right here in my arms right now. And thanks be to God, literally, he started to breathe. And at that point, our friend had problems way beyond our pay grade. And we, we didn't know how to help him. But we knew who could, and it was the doctors in Kerrville. And we rushed him over there. And I'm glad to say that after a long period of time, he was okay. Now, believe it or not, there is a Bible account that has a lot in common with this story. And it is, in fact, the blueprint for young life. And before I get into it, I'd like to share it with you. Before I get into it, uh, I need to set it up. Jesus was out visiting a town. Okay? He, notice he wasn't sitting in a temple going, hey, let's see who shows up today. He was out with the people. And the second thing to notice is there's crowds, huge crowds. People liked Jesus. He had started doing a few miracles by this time, but even before that, they liked Jesus. They wanted him around. They invited him to parties. They invited him to weddings that lasted a week at a time. They really liked him. And the, the best way I've ever heard Jesus described is he's the guy that would come over to your house to watch the game. He'd eat barbecue with you. He'd roll around on the grass with your kids and wrestle. And if the game ran late, he'd just crash right there on your couch. And when he listened to you, he listened like he had all the time in the world. And people wanted him around. So he's visiting people in this town. He goes into somebody's house. He sits down. He starts to teach. Well, the crowds follow him in there, and the, the crowd overflows out of the house into the yard. It overflows out of that into the street, and that's where we pick up this story. It says, Some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. 
Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it, and they lowered the mat the, mat the man was lying on. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. So what's going on here is there's four guys that are best friends, and they have a fifth friend, and they love this guy, but he's paralyzed. And they hear Jesus is in town, and they're like, hey, He's healed some people. Let's get Joe and get him over to Jesus. And maybe he'll heal him. And so they go and they're carrying him over there. And they aren't like carrying corners of a mat. It's more like a stretcher. And they're carrying him over there. And they get there and they're like, oh, we're too late. Because the crowd was so big and out into the street. It's like they were like 20, 20 rows back at a rock concert. And they want to get to the front row. You can't even walk through that crowd by yourself, much less carry a stretcher, so they're stuck. And they're like, what do we do? And one of the guys notices a rope on the side of the house. And he's like, hey, I got an idea. And uh, next thing they know, they're on the roof above where they think Jesus is, and they're starting to dig. And the people inside, they're listening to Jesus. They hear these noises, and they're like, what, what is going on? And they start looking up, and then there's... There's dust falling, and then there's crumblies falling, and then there's, there's daylight, and it's getting bigger and bigger. And they're like, hey, what's going on? They're tearing a hole in this guy's roof. They're ruining his house. And while all the chaos is going on, I think Jesus was sitting there, and he's looking up at him, and he's got a smile on his face, and he's going, that's the kind of faith I'm looking for. And these guys lower their friend down to the very feet of God himself and at that point everybody saw just what everybody always saw with this guy they saw a paralyzed guy laying on a mat except for Jesus he looked past that he looked into the man's heart and he saw the sin that was keeping him separated from a relationship with God and he knew that that was an even bigger problem than paralysis and he didn't waste a second instantly he said, son, your sins are forgiven. And that's where we pick it back up. It says, now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this man talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this is what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven? Or to say, get up, take your mat and go home. But I want you to know the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. And he got up, and he walked right through the middle of the naysayers, and his life was changed forever. And that is what young life leaders and staff do. They have their teenage friends that have problems that are way beyond their pay grade. Stuff they can't help them with, but they know who can help them, and that's Jesus Christ. And they do whatever they can to carry the kid to the feet of Jesus. But instead of four people carrying a stretcher, the leader uses the four C's of young life, which is club, camp, campaigners, and contact work, and they do whatever they can to get that kid to the feet of Jesus, including overcoming the crowd. Now, being a teenager is hard, and I'm sure if you remember back, you'll remember it is hard. But being a teenager, when the world is upside down with its hair on fire, is even more difficult. And the best way I can explain what they're going through is with a demonstration. This guitar represents a teenager. It's high strung, it makes a lot of noise, but it's looking good on the outside. And teenagers are looking good on the outside. They got their mask up. They got their walls up. They're looking good. This hammer represents the pain and damage that they experience from the world, from the sins of others, and from their own sins. Now, teenagers, like all of us, have a need inside. And we're instinctively trying to fulfill that need. And... Teenagers will turn to technology first. That's the, the internet, social media, 
phones and text, and that opens them up to uh, human trafficking and bullying and boatloads of pornography and superficiality. And why do I say superficiality? Because they don't talk anymore. Kids will be at a dinner table together and they won't speak. They'll text each other. And texting, you talk in little word clumps. And if you're communicating only in little word clumps, you stay up here, very superficial. You can't get down deep and deal with the real things in life. Oh, and here's, here's a little quick fact for you. 98% of teenagers want to be social media influencers because that's where they get their meaning in life. And that opens them up to anxiety and uh, isolation and depression and suicide. And then there's the sins of other people. You got divorce. You got uh, mental, physical, emotional, and sexual abuse. Then there's their own sins. They've got the lying, cheating, stealing, drinking which is going off the charts, drug use, which is going off the charts, uh, and it's fentanyl and meth. And then, did I mention boatloads of pornography? And then any other things that I haven't mentioned. And this is what a teenager looks like on the inside. And then along comes a young life leader. And leaders go out to where kids are. They go to practices and games and plays. They eat lunch at the schools with the kids. Anywhere teenagers are, that's where young life leaders and staff go. And they get to know these kids and they build a relationship and they become trusted adult role models. And the leaders will take those relationships and they'll bring them deep and they'll mix them thoroughly with Jesus Christ. And teenagers want what every single person here wants. They want to be known for who they are and loved. And so at a certain point, they'll get to trust that leader enough that they will with great trepidation hold themselves out and say, this is the real me. Please don't laugh and please don't leave. And the leader will say, hey, I understand. I've been there and done that. When I was your age, we could have been twins. But I found a way out and it's through a relationship with Jesus Christ. And if you accept Jesus into your heart, your sins will be forgiven. The Holy Spirit will come and live in you and He will never leave you. And He'll always be there to guide you. And you won't have to turn to social media for fulfillment. You, God created you with a purpose. And when you're doing that purpose, you'll find all the significance you're looking for. And then the leader will tell them one other thing. They'll say, God is not going to fix this because that's not good enough for him. That would leave tape and glue lines. Instead, in the Bible, it says, if you accept Jesus into your heart, you become a new creation. It says the old has passed away. And now all is new. And they get a truly new start with unlimited possibilities. And if the kid decides to accept Christ, the leader will walk along beside them and teach them what it means to live for Jesus. And they'll get them plugged into a local church. If the kid decides not to accept Christ, the leader will continue to love them, hang out with them, pray for them, because our relationships with teens and young life aren't, aren't uh, founded on whether they accept Christ or not. We just love teenagers. And when you take relationships and you go that deep and you mix it with Jesus Christ, they last a lot longer than, uh, than just high school. For example, 
Just the other day, I got a call from one of my old Young Life kids. I uh, haven't talked to him in 25 years. Two minutes into the call, he was crying his eyes out because his life has fallen apart so badly. And we talked and we prayed. And before we got off the phone, he said, thanks, man. I just needed to know somebody was on my side. 25 years later, he's calling his Young Life leader. And I don't tell you these stories to pat myself on the back. I tell any of these stories just because that's what I experienced. Uh, when I was a leader, I was talking to a kid, and he was spilling his guts about his life. And when he was done in a purely healthy way, I said, I love you, man. You're a good guy. And he started crying. And I said, what are you crying for? And uh, he said, nobody's ever told me they love me, not even my parents. And then another time, uh, I was a leader, and one of my kids called me. And he said, hey, I need to talk. Can you come over? And I said, yeah. I mean, if you're a leader and you get that call, you go immediately. And I went over there, and he met me in his driveway, and he said, I have to have an operation and I have a 25% chance of living. And we sat right there on his driveway, and we talked, and we cried, and we prayed, and he asked me, what's heaven gonna be like? Because he had accepted Christ through young life, and he knew that if he died, he was going to heaven. And I'm glad to say he lived through it, and we're still friends 30 years later. In another story, and there was two guys, they were best friends, and I got to be really, really good friends with them. And they went to camp with us, and they accepted Christ into their hearts at camp. And we came back, and a week or two later, they just showed up at my door. And uh, I opened the door, and they said, hey, so we wanted to tell you, we were growing pot next to the house, and we just got finished pulling up the plants and throwing them in the canal because that's not doing our best to follow Jesus. I was like, oh. And then not too terribly long after that, one of those kids died in a car wreck. And I'm going to get to see him again when I go to heaven. And I'm really looking forward to that reunion. Then I got one more story about a guy who was not going to Young Life. His name was Brian. And Brian was not going to Young Life in high school. And one day an upperclassman girl came up to him and said, you're going to Young Life tonight. And he said, yes, I am. And so he went, and he came back, and his mom said, hey, how was it? And he said, it was pretty good. I won the raffle. And she said, really? What did you win? And he said, an old, dirty tennis shoe won. And she was like, what? And he goes, if that's their sense of humor, that's hilarious. I'm going to go back. And so he started going back. And every time he went back, he heard about Jesus Christ in terms that he could understand, and that is a young life specialty. He ended up becoming a Christian. He started bringing his friends. Some of them became Christians. Then when he got in college, he became a leader, and he uh, started bringing tons and tons of kids, and lots of them became Christians. Now he's got kids of his own. He's raising them to become Christians because changed lives lead to changed lives. You see, Brian had an experience with Jesus Christ at Young Life. And you can't help but have that change your life. And change lives lead to change lives. And the first time I talked about change lives was back in the Bible account. And there's some details in that story that I've never heard anybody talk about. And those are the rope and the mat. The rope and the mat were made of hemp and cotton. And those are crops, and it takes a farmer to plant and grow and harvest the crops. Then it takes a weaver to weave that into a rope and a mat. Then it takes a buyer to buy that mat and give it to the paralyzed guy and buy the rope, use it for whatever, leave it on the side of the house. And if it wasn't for the rope and mat, those guys never would have been able to get on the roof and lower their friend to Jesus. And he never would have met Jesus. The rope and the mat are critical, but so are the people behind the scenes the farmers, the weavers, and the buyers. In the context of tonight, you take the place of the farmers, the weavers, and the buyers, and you do it through your donations. Your donations are critical to us. Uh, without them, 
It's not that we do Young Life poorly, it's that we can't do Young Life at all. So your donations are critical. And what it goes towards, it goes towards club, camp, campaigners, contact work. It goes to pay the staff to drive this ship and they find leaders and they bring them on board and they train them, all that gets going. And the more leaders we have, the more kids we reach, the more schools we get into, the more kids we reach. And that's what your money goes towards. Tonight, we have figured out that we need to raise $100,000 and the number of people in the room, if you divide it all out, if each person in the room would give $33 a month, we'd reach our goal. If you want to round it up to 50 or 100 or 500 or 1,000 a month, hey, that's great. That puts us in tall cotton. But $33 a month reaches us, gets us to that goal. Now, notice I'm talking about monthly giving instead of one-time giving. If we get large influxes of capital now and large influxes during the fishing tournament, we have to try to stretch that through the whole year. And it's pretty tough. And there's some inefficiencies in there that we can't avoid. But if you give monthly, then we can budget and forecast and get even more out of every dollar that is donated. Now, we're not gonna put your name on a building. We're not gonna put your name on paver stones and make a sidewalk. Those things are temporary anyway. But I can guarantee you that your money is gonna to go towards helping a kid meet Christ and their name is gonna go in God's book of life and that is permanent. Now, if you can't give, th there's no guilt coming from up here, okay? The, the economy is whacked. Uh, it's tough, I know, but if you can't give, there's still some things you can do. And that is, you could pray for us. Uh, you know, set a reminder on your phone. Pray for us daily. That would be a big deal. Uh, the other thing is, be an advocate in the community for us. We don't advertise. We save all our advertising money and put it towards ministry. Our, our name is spread through word of mouth. So tell people about us and what we do. The other thing is, you can get involved. Uh, you can be on committee. You could be a leader. You could be involved with Young Lives or any other things. We, we've got all kinds of places we can plug you into. So if you can't give, get involved in one of those ways, and we would really appreciate it. If you can give, I'm going to be so bold as to say, give big. Give till it hurts. We, we will use every single penny of it. And the other thing is you can give. We're a nonprofit, so you can write this off. Give yourself, but then your business needs a write-off also. Have your business donate also. Um, one last thing is give tonight, please. Don't walk out and think that you'll do it later. Uh, most people forget if they do that. And this, like I said, this thing, this stuff is really important to us. So please give tonight. In a second, I'm going to close, uh, and we're going to have three to four minutes of music. And on your table, you'll see some cards there. You can fill those out for donations, or there's a QR code. If you want to use a QR code, it's, it's easier to do. Just get your camera on your phone, have it look at it. Don't take a picture of it, just point it at it. A window will pop up, tap it, you go straight into the app, and it, it does. It's super easy. You can set up one-time giving, monthly giving. You can do anything you want in there. So we'll have three or four minutes of that, then somebody's going to come up and dismiss us. So. I'm about to pray, but if anything I said rings a bell with you and you have not accepted Christ into your heart and you would like to, afterwards, grab me, grab the staff, grab uh, the leaders. Any, any of those people will be glad to help you uh, accept Christ. It's very easy to do. It's the most important decision you'll, you'll ever make in your life. So let me pray and then we'll get out of here. Uh, Lord, thank you for young life. Thank you for making us all a part of it. Uh, thank you for using us to reach lost high school kids. Uh, thank you for the donations. I pray that we put them to good use and that we get enough to, to make it through the year. And uh, I just lay it all at your feet and trust you. And I pray these things in your name. Amen.